Let's talk about what's been going on since Avdiivka. There are reports that Russia continues to move westward. And uh, there, of course, uh, in a matter of a week, there were two U.S. Abrams tanks destroyed. <laughs> and I believe there are reports now that a HIMARS system has just been destroyed. All of this is being taken through telegram channels, footage being released, video footage of this happening. So, Scott, could you just uh, give an outline of where where things are going on the battlefield? Where is Russia moving westward? And uh, what does that portend for the conflict moving forward, given all that we've spoken about politically and where things are uh, for the United States, for NATO and and of course, for Russia on the other side? Um. First of all, to understand the battlefield, you have to understand um, how war has changed. Uh, the war that's being fought today is so far different from the war that um, the conflict is being fought today. Somebody said, what's the difference between a war and the special military operation? A war, um, Kiev wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, rail, the, the trains wouldn't run on time. Bridges would be down. Tunnels would be blown up. Uh, Ukraine would be... Um, blown off the face of the earth. That's what a war is. A special military operation is designed to achieve specific objectives, demilitarization, denazification, keeping Ukraine neutral, but it's not designed to destroy Ukraine. This is why uh, foreign uh, you know, delegations can go to Kiev on a train, arrive in Kiev, um, meet with the president and not worry about dying. Um, if Ukraine was at war, those meetings wouldn't take place because the president of Ukraine would either be deeply underground in some undisclosed location or dead. The parliament wouldn't be meeting because the parliament wouldn't exist. The minister of defense wouldn't be in Kiev. He'd be in some bunker someplace outside of Kiev because the ministry of defense would be blown up. Um, that's what a war would be. Um, so we, we look at the battlefield today. Um, War has changed. When when this war started, you you people working off a of Cold War era doctrinal thinking. That is, you have tank columns, you have artillery uh, that operates in battery or battalion size formations, uh, flooding a zone with artillery. You have big arrow movement and things of that nature. Um, that changed into more of a static situation, and now technology has has brought itself in. Counter battery warfare made it difficult to have, you know, I couldn't bring up my battery of eight guns anymore because you're going to take out my guns. I have to break my battery up into singletons or pairs that work, shoot, come back, and I have to spread everything out. Drones started coming in, not just for targeting purposes, not just for deep strike purposes, but tactical drones on the battlefront. These FPV drones are a nightmare for soldiers. Um, if you have a, you know, I, if I tried to take Marines into combat using the tactics that I was taught and tried to deploy a company, uh, you know, with my you know two platoons online, base of fire, et cetera, my base of fire would disappear because it'd be swarmed by FPV drones who would kill everybody. And then my Marines attacking would be hit by these drones and they're all dead. Uh, you don't see those kind of attacks. You see small groups of people moving forward uh, at a time. So if they get caught by drones, you only lose five, six guys. You don't lose, you know, 150. Um, the same thing, you don't want to give them big targets. Artillery, if I'm going to fire artillery, and I used to have to bring in a lot of artillery and just park it by the guns. And then you bam, 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 fire it off. Today, you can't do it because you park a lot of artillery rounds in there. High Mars comes in, a drone comes in, boom, all your artillery ammunition's gone, and you're done. And so what I'm trying to get at is that in order to do big arrow operations, to seize a lot of territory, requires a lot of logistics support. It requires a lot of command and control that used to be very centralized. Now everything has to be decentralized, which means to carry out an operation today, um, you can't bite off a big chunk anymore. You have to be, you have to deal with the fact that, you know, you need gasoline. But if I bring in 10 days worth of gas up to the front line, that goes up. I don't have any more gas. So I got to bring my gas in small containers. That way, if it gets hit, I can go to other routes, but I've broken my reserves up. I don't want everything in one place. I've broken it up. So now it's all dispersed. It takes longer to get resources to the battlefield. And therefore, you you have to fight a war in a, in a, in a more restricted fashion. Meaning instead of saying, I'm going to go 10 kilometers today, you say, I'm going to go 100 meters today. 
And that's the resources you're able to bring to bear because of the reality of this war. You can't bring in all the masses and stuff um, to, to move forward. You can't have the artillery, the gas, the ammunition, the troops, etc. So war is slowed down. It's still very bloody, still very violent, but it's slowed down. Um, and it's created a situation because you can't concentrate so much power that if I take a tree line and the enemy counterattacks, it's probably going to be require me to withdraw from that tree line. So you saw a lot of going forward, a lot of going back, a lot of going forward, a lot of going back, trading it. And it's just choosing the lives and all this stuff. Um, then comes the the new battle, the, the battle of Ad, Advievka. Um, what we saw there is something happened. Um, the Ukrainians lost combat cohesion. And they lost combat cohesion because they lost the ability to sustain the firepower fight. They had to ration artillery. They no longer had uh, the ability to uh, flood the zone with drones. Um, whatever ammunition they were bringing up, the Russians were suddenly controlling the rear area, blowing up the ammunition, blowing up troop concentrations. You couldn't uh, rotate troops effectively. So troops on the front line were getting tired. You couldn't evacuate the wounded. Combat cohesion broke. And you saw in Advievka uh, places, strongholds that normally would have held. It had been very difficult for Russia to take just falling because the Ukrainians lost the ability to defend. Um, and so they it, they just evaporated. And suddenly, because, you know, it was a tough fight, tough type. Tough fight, tough fight, tough fight, tough fight, tough fight, tough fight. Tough fight. That was over. Combat cohesion disappeared. The Ukrainians are gone. Now the Ukrainians are falling back on uh, defensive positions that are not well prepared, and they don't have sufficient resources. The, 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 it's not like there's a fresh group of troops there, and these other guys pass through lines, go back and refit. The guys that just got defeated fall in on these new lines, and the Russians aren't pausing. They're still going forward. Not big arrow stuff, because... The Ukrainians still have some ability to reach out and touch. So you, the Russians are still limited by what they're going to do because they don't want to give a big target to the Ukrainians. So they do these tactics, but the Ukrainians can't push them back. The Russians take a tree line. There's no counterattack. The Russians then take the front line of the villages. Next day, they move in to the center. They go take a hill. And it's just a slow, gradual. There's no meaningful Ukrainian pushback because there's nothing for the Ukrainians to put back. And as the Russians do this, they're able now, because the Ukrainians now have the ability to launch those counter-battery strikes, they're able to concentrate their artillery more, which means more death and destruction. They're able to bring in more drones across the entire battlefield. And the, basically, the Russians are just, in, they've, they've, they've reached the tipping point, and they are, the, they are dominating the battlefield in a way that we haven't seen ever since this war. I mean, they're doing advances that have been unseen since the first days of this war, uh, but it's in a much more controlled fashion. They're not going to have a column go off, get cut off and destroyed. They're just one bite here. One, they're doing along the entire front and it's just booming it. And the Ukrainians right now, they're running out of manpower. And eventually I think what you're going to see in the not too distant future, people are talking about it. All right. Is Ukrainians will have no choice to either, either their troops will all collapse, get surrounded and killed or they're going to have to make a big move to the Dnieper River and try and use the the water the Dnieper River as a water barrier uh, to thin out their defenses and, and and focus in on you know defending other areas. They're going to lose some cities. Kharkov already. You hear people talking about the you know you, our Kharkov's and it, it can't be defended. Um, you know there's you know the 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 Russians are on the way to totally liberating all of uh, Donetsk, um, all of Zaporizhia. Um, and eventually they're going to get the right bank of Kherson back and make a move on Odessa. Um, this is just the reality. There's nothing the Ukrainians can do to stop them right now. They don't have any more manpower. They're rationing ammunition and rationing ammunition. You know, it, it's like somebody on a starvation diet. You know, you've, you've, instead of getting a loaf of bread a day, now we've, we've gone to half a loaf. We're rationing food, quarter loaf. We're rationing food. Well, it just means we have a quarter loaf. We don't have a loaf of bread. And eventually down to one little crumb. You still have bread, which means you still have artillery rounds. But once you eat that crumb, you got nothing. And that's where the Ukrainians are right now. They, they've got crumbs. So like if the Russians make a mistake, Ukrainians have the ability to concentrate resources and, and hit them. They're still getting the intelligence support from the West. The communications is still there. So if the Russians give them a target, the Ukrainians will hit the target. Um, and we've seen that. But generally speaking... The Ukrainians can't sustain that kind of counter-strike capability. So while they can punch the Russians here, punch the Russians there, punch the Russians here, then they've got nothing because they've run out of anything, and then the Russians just keep going. And that's where we're at right now.
in the the loss of life i mean it's massive for especially for ukraine i mean the western media mainstream media has always likes to hype up despite uh, very questionable uh, numbers often uh, discussed when it comes to the russian side when there's very pro western sources that we could find uh that show that actually uh, uh russia russia is, is losing people and you talk about this all the time so you say russia is losing uh, uh people they are losing troops they are losing forces and it's not anything to joke about but uh, uh ukraine that's where it's downplayed and so how likely is it that that scenario takes place and how soon do you think it might take place a scenario where either uh, uh they surrender because they're completely surrounded there just is there's just no manpower left or that they have to take other desperate measures to um you know to prevent such a thing from happening well i'm sort of a you know, once bitten twice shy kind of thing um i'm 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 trying to be more careful with calendar predictions because um you know for instance i didn't it wasn't until this last trip to to russia where i sat down with some of these russian commanders uh and they explained the reality of the battlefield i was you know i was assessing battlefield potential based upon, you know, Cold War era maneuver uh, capacity. And so, you know, my my brain is saying, you know, if this, this, this happens, then this is the result. And all the Russian commanders are like, no, 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 no. Ratchet it back, pal, uh, because you're assuming that you're going to come in with a complement of ammunition, a complement of fuel, and, uh, and, and and make those kind. That's not how we operate anymore. You, we have dispersed everything because we have to, because of the nature of war. Uh, just because we're killing the Ukrainians in, in bigger numbers than we are doesn't mean they don't have the intelligence. We still have to be aware of the fact that NATO is collecting intelligence against us and that uh, the Ukrainians, if we give them a target, they will strike it. There are HIMARS out there that will strike a target if we give them the target, and they've proven that. Um, so we can't give them the ammunition uh, depot. We can't give them the fuel accumulation. We can't give them the troop concentration. We're still fighting a very dispersed war, which dictates uh, certain realities when it comes to you know limits of advance. Um, and once you program that in there, you realize that the, you know, I, I haven't been wrong about the Russians winning, and I haven't been wrong about military math. What I've been off on is, um, you know, how that translates into, you know, shifts on the battlefield. I have been expecting much more dramatic uh, shifts, um, um, you know, based upon the military math of the situation. But that's because I've been thinking like a Marine and uh, in, in old fashioned maneuver warfare where I'm going to now take a, a tank army and move it around here and do this. That ain't what's happening anymore. It's slower advances. It's going to be slow advances going forward because the Russians aren't in the business of losing men. Yes, they can concentrate. Yes, they can push, but then they'll lose a lot of guys. And that's not how the Russian army operates. All this talk about human wave assaults, it's BS. That's just not how the Russian army operates. Can their troops get caught out? <laughs> Hell yeah. I mean, if you if you've moved in and you start an attack and you get caught in the open with, uh, you know, DPICM, dual purpose computer cluster bombs, it's a bad day. You're going to die. Um, if, if your tank is hit and an FPV is running around and you're trying to dodge it, likely if another FPV comes in, you're going to die. You're going to get hit by an FP. You're going to die. That's the lethality of the modern battlefield. And it's, you know, the Ukrainians know this because they're dying in large number. But the Russians are dying also in large numbers, not as large as the Ukrainians. But this is a very bloody, bloody, deadly war. And if you give the enemy an opportunity, they will kill you. And the Ukrainians still have the capacity to kill Russians. It's a, it's a reality. So the Russians are going to do this based upon what is sustainable in terms of achieving their objectives without um, creating the conditions to, um, you know, suffer massive casualties on the part of the Russians. But I will say this, I, I, and I can name the guy now, Opti Aladanov. Um, he's a, uh, Russian general, Chechen general, but, uh, he commanded the second army corps, I think in Lugansk, a very experienced frontline commander. Um, he was recently pulled off of the, of the uh, front lines and sent to the Russian, um, um, the general staff Academy, uh, to, uh, I think the thing, not just to get education, but also 
it's part of a process where they take combat commanders, they bring them in, and they talk with other combat commanders about uh, refining doctrine and working on techniques, uh, you know, from a command perspective on how to fight the war better. So they were basically taking his experience and getting him to help shape that experience so that other Russian generals could learn from it. This man's a very capable officer, very professional officer. He's not one to um, exaggerate. He's not one to, you know, say things that aren't true. And um, I had had a conversation with him in January, but I didn't want to talk about it because I'm like, well, I don't want to, you know, I didn't know if this was just a conversation with me or whatever, but he's given a briefing since then. He did a, 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 a he gave an interview where he said the same things he said to me. So I have no problem saying it and I have no problem using his name because he's gone public with this. Um, he, he basically said that he believes that very dramatic things are going to happen on the battlefield. It's military math. He agrees hundred percent with my military mathematical equation uh, where we have a situation where the Ukrainians have finite resources. They're getting ground down at a rate that's far greater than they can replace it. So, you know, every day they lose a thousand men, they may get, a hundred to replace them. They're 900 down. Next day, they're going to lose a thousand more. They may get a hundred to replace them. They're 1800 down. And eventually that's math. You can't do the Russians. Meanwhile, let's say they lose 400 men. They get, you know, a thousand. So they're 600 up. Next day they lose 400. They get a thousand. They're 1200 up. And this military math just creates a massive imbalance of it eventually. And that's what's happening. And eventually it's going to lead to the collapse of the Ukrainian army, something I've been predicting for some time now. But again, my timetable was based upon some analytical assumptions that were flawed. Um, uh, Abdi Aladanov helped educate me about the reality of the battlefield. Um, it, you know, the, the optimistic outlook for Russia's, uh, you know, for Russia is, is still very much valid. And the logic behind that is valid. It's just going to take a little bit time to, un, you know, to unfold. But I think he said that by May, you're going to see really dramatic things. Um, and what I mean by that is not only moving to the Dnieper, but Kharkov and maybe Odessa falling kind of stuff. And he said that uh, unless something dramatic happens, it's all over by September. This is Abdi Aladanov. This is a Russian military commander, frontline commander, uh, saying this. He says that the, the Ukrainians simply can't sustain this uh, this fight. Um, and I agree with him. Uh, again, if I hadn't had the conversation with him and some other commanders about the battlefield, I would have, you know, guessed uh, I would have even had a more accelerated uh, standpoint. But they educated me, and it, it's good to get educated. Uh, it's they educated me about the reality of the battlefield. Um, that I was basically using some Cold War era thinking and um, that war isn't fought the way that I used to fight war. It's a completely different war. And this is something that I think the, the West needs to wake up to, too, you know, because there's a lot of guys right now in NATO that are still fighting the war that I was trained to fight, the Cold War war. Uh, they're talking about tank columns. They're talking about traditional setups. They're talking about logistics push. Whenever I hear an American logistics, we're going to do a logistics push. I, now I'm having listened to Opti on how they destroy logistics. I'm like, no, you're not. You're going to die because you don't have a counter drone strategy. You don't know how to do this war. You haven't figured out the kind of artillery support. You don't have forward air defense to suppress the Russian uh, fab bombs now that have the uh, the glider wings on it that can punch in deeper. You don't have no clue how to respond to a Lancet swarm uh, that uses AI to pick out targets and come in and kill 200 targets at one time. We're not thinking like that. We don't know how to operate like that. And if we try to engage the Russians, the, the battle will be over instantaneously. Um, the Ukrainians know how to fight this. That's why they're, I mean, the, the irony here is that um, probably the second best army in Europe is the Ukrainian army today because of the combat experience that they have uh, acquired. They know how to fight this, this modern war. Um, they know how to incorporate drones. Fact is, the Russians learned a lot about drone warfare from the Ukrainians. I was told that too, that the Ukrainian, early on, the Ukrainian drone operators were pretty damn good. And they came up with innovative tactics and, uh, and implementation that, that, that cost the Russians dearly. But the Russians learned from that, adapted, took it over, improved. And now the Russians are dominating the battle. 
But the thing about an enemy, an innovative enemy, is that they, they're always thinking. And again, the Ukrainians are an innovative enemy of Russia. They're always thinking. And so they're out there right now coming up. Look, they just sank a Russian ship. <laughs> you know, that shows you the fight that these guys have. They are innovative. They're thinking. They're deadly. If Russia, you know, it's not even a matter of Russia letting its guard down. Russia is going to take losses because the Ukrainians are a tough enemy. They're fighting hard. It's just that military math is not in their favor. Um, and it doesn't matter how much of a hard fighter you are. If you don't have the resources to sustain, sustain this kind of battle, it's all she wrote. And they don't have the manpower resources. They don't have the ammunition resources. And they're running out of all resources. And combat cohesion will collapse. And when it collapses, it doesn't matter how brave you are. The end result is always the same. You're going to die. And according to Opti Aladanov, we're going to see collapse probably by May. And we're going to see it all ending by September. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.